Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage and I'm the Executive Editor with My Security Media. And today we're going to be crossing to Canberra and looking at Canberra's hackerspace analysis of InfoSec, researching with a passion. And I've been looking forward to this particular interview with Kylie McDevitt and Silvio Cesare, both InfoSec researchers. Uh, and this follows off on a uh, blog from Kylie. Kylie McDevitt and Silvio Cesare. Uh, Kylie and Silvio, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. Hello. Yeah, thanks thank you very much. Fun. Thank you. Uh, and uh, like I said, welcome to uh, throw in any questions and say good day to Kylie and uh, Silvio. Kylie, this follows off on a, a really interesting blog post that you wrote. Uh, you two are on a new journey uh, in business there in Canberra. It's not kind of new. You've been sort of building this up for a couple of years as well. Um, but yeah, maybe introduce us to InfoSec and uh, then we'll just dive into uh, a general discussion. Awesome. Um, well, I guess, um, yeah, so the blog post I um, sort of wrote about my first six months at InfoSec. So I quit my full-time job in January and decided to come on full-time at InfoSec, which, was, which has been a change for me, um, a really great journey. And I just wanted to share that with other people and maybe motivate other people to look at, you know, pushing themselves out of their... Um, out of their comfort zone and doing something different. Um, in terms of what InfoSec is, so for us, um, we've had the space for about, uh, I think we bought it early 2017, so we've had about four years. Um, it's definitely a space that we open a lot to the public, um, run different events to sort of upskill people in cybersecurity, um, and we wanna collaborate and work with people. Um, there's sort of uh, three parts to InfoSec. There's our sort of our community part where we do uh, invite people in. We do different sort of events. Uh, we do, um, Sylvia will probably correct me if I miss something, but we do things such as uh, software defined radio um, uh, events. We do hardware hacking. And even Sylvia just runs a social event um, once a week as well. Uh, and then we have our training, which is sort of that professional a training, paid training that we offer to, to people. And we also have our consulting that we do as well. Yeah. Well, uh, Silvio, maybe to you as well. I think uh, in in the blog it uh, was 2017, and you're the former uh, uh, director of education at the Cybersecurity Centre with the University of New South Wales. So uh, it's one of those things of taking it from a sort of a, a, a academic approach, and then out there on your own, you can do your own research as well. Is that what you were looking for? Maybe your your sort of background and journey into this as well, and then you've pulled Kylie from uh, from her <laughs> government job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she couldn't resist. So, yeah, maybe how you've been motivated to get this going as well. Yeah, look, I have a bit of a mixed background um, in industry and also academia. Immediately before going full time at InfoSec about three years ago, I was, as you said, the Director of Education and Training at UNSW Canberra. Previously, it was called Australian Centre for Cybersecurity, uh, yep. previous to that name. Um, but that was a great experience. I really, I, I, I do have a bit of a love hate affair with academia. I always, ca I can't help but keep my my toe in the academic, you know, door a little bit. Um, but working full time at the university, um, overseeing their content and delivery, making sure that they had high quality um, education and training provided, um, and that we had the right lecturers to develop that content was a really great um, starting point for 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 what I eventually took and 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 and, and took with InfoSec. Um, and at InfoSec, I mean, we, we, we do have that opportunity to provide very specialist training that probably isn't as um, as it, sort of as desirable in the university space. I think university does want to stay a little bit broader and not, you know, and, and cybersecurity is such a, an infancy stage in sort of the broader, you know, academic and wider industry that uh, that that we don't have the, 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 you know, the 50 or 100 or 200 years of education, you know, that, that yeah. engineering has or something like that has. So InfoSec gave me a great opportunity to develop these very specialist courses uh, and provide a very sort of niche spot in the market for the stuff that we really enjoy doing. Um, and as a result, we've, um, you know, it, it, it only became uh, more and more successful once we sort of, uh, I went there full time. And now to where we are that we've got um, Kylie here as well full time. Um, and the rest of our staff as well was sort of on a, uh, you know, we've grown a little bit in the past year and we're up to about almost uh, seven full-time, seven, sorry, seven staff and yep. looking for an eighth very soon. Wow. Well, that's what I, I've been following Kylie on Twitter and uh, how, how, again, once, once I saw the blog and you're telling that story and all I can do is encourage you to keep doing that because, you know, you do get, as you say, that community involved uh, mm -hmm. and it's a, 
I, I watched with a little bit of jealousy too of like, you know, it's like, oh, you know, that's really good. It looks really good uh, to do what you're doing. Um, what was the what was the catalyst for you, Kylie, maybe? And again, this is a great uh, women in cyber security sort of story too. What was the catalyst for you, do you think? Was it the, the business driving this where you felt, you know, Sylvia just pointed out, you're growing, you know, your staff and now you're going to eight. So there's obviously a business drive there. Was that it? Because um, you guys are, you know, husband and wife too. So sometimes <laughs> one has to follow yeah. the passion while the other one has to pay the mortgage, so to, so to speak. Yeah, yeah true. And, exactly. uh, and I'd been in government for a long time. So I'd been um, there since 2009. So I was coming up 12 years this year. Yeah. Um, and it was a hard decision because I loved my job. It definitely wasn't a boring job and it wasn't just paying the mortgage. It was actually um, a great job to be in as well. I guess um, we the business was growing and Sylvia was going to have to hire someone if I didn't step out. Um, and I just thought, you know, I have I had been there for 12 years. It was time to sort of um, try something else, something new. Um, and I will say that my leadership were, were really actually very supportive. They did say, if it doesn't work out, you can come back. <laughs> so it wasn't sort of cutting hard ties. I knew that there was, you know, that that community that was there would always be there behind me if I needed, if InfoSec flops and I need to go back, I'll be back there. So. Yeah. And, and I should also say that even though Kylie wasn't there full time from the very beginning, I mean, she was an integral part of every of step of the process and, you know, had been doing things in, you know, after hours for, for years <laughs> before coming on full time. So it really was a natural or well, from my perspective, and maybe not Kylie's perspective, I thought it was a natural progression and um, uh, you know, really a necessary one for the business as well. Well, we've covered off on career transitions, and uh, this is, you know, obviously a, a, another similar type story. And then we also take a lot of interest in the business side as well. Um, so I've put the link out on to the Asia Pacific Security Magazine Facebook page and then our YouTube channel. So if you want to have a look at Kylie's blog there, Stepping Off the Cliff Edge, uh, yeah. as it was titled. Uh, and that's quite a good story. And it's based off, uh, well, you're, you've been inspired by groups like The Loft in the USA. So you had a, a, a vision here, which I think, again, is important that you're following that vision and a passion, hence why I, I uh, titled this Researching with a Passion. Maybe talk us into a bit more deeper into the research that you're doing. And you have a, an OT security grant, research grant, I understand. Um, we have a research grant around um, uh, uh, vulnerability research and, and discovery yeah. of bugs, not specifically OT, um, but we do have an, a strong interest in OT. I have a strong interest in OT. I did a lot of work um, when I was in the ACSC on um, OT um, from about, I think, um, when CERT mogged into the ACSC or into ASD a couple of years ago, we yeah. sort of our remit expanded from just government into sort of the critical infrastructure space. So we got that opportunity to to, to um, take all our uh, great cyber knowledge um, of enterprise systems and such and move it into sort of that OT, OT space and upskill in that. So as part of that, I got to be part of a, an OT build out at the, the ACSC. Um, and then of course, coming to InfoSec, you don't want to drop your passion. You don't, mm. <laughs> you, you want to take that knowledge and, and continue building on it. And um, definitely we've been um, uh, sort of toying around with um, a, a smaller um, OT environment in InfoSec with some smaller PLCs, not the same, uh, you know, $20,000 PLC for some of the, the more uh, industrial ones. Um, uh, but definitely the, the the theory behind how control systems work, how, you know, that operational technology is different to, you know, IT yeah. um, and, and sort of the limitations in security that you find in those environments and how to sort of lift up that security is something we're still looking at at InfoSec and wanting to, to sort of um, be a part of that um, knowledge transition across Australia as well. Well, I, I, again, I can highlight the webinar that we did yesterday with the Department of Home Affairs uh, yeah. and the critical infrastructure legislation. It's worth watching uh, because, again, Home Affairs has taken over the policy and you've mentioned sort of the ACSC and, and ASD, which are more of the technical yeah. forefront of that. But then the challenge of government and you, you literally just also highlighted these 20 grand PLCs that are out there. Do you get yeah. your hands on those at all? Are you working with anyone uh, that is sort of supporting you with that to say, okay, break this one. Because we've done some uh, interviews before where some of the Siemens and, and the other PLC 
uh, sort of manufacturers, even the new PLCs are getting uh, vulnerabilities and CVEs disclosed on them. Uh, yeah, we're, we, how, do, how do you, what's your approach? Maybe that's maybe a better yeah. question in terms of how you, how you tackle a, a PLC and, <laughs> and the ones that are out, out and actually in the field. Um, so currently we're not looking at any PLCs and we're probably more looking at the architectural protection around the PLCs. Okay, yeah. We're definitely looking more at, uh, at IoT devices and Sylvia would probably can talk uh, quite in depth in the way we would tackle an IoT device um, in terms of um, how we would um, interact. an IoT style device, the, the normal approach that we would do is, um, you know, is uh, we would like the device itself. I mean, that's sort of the first starting point, whether that's, you know, you can just purchase most IT devices, you know, commercially off online. Um, we would try to do things like dump the firmware of the device and try to extract the software uh, and get, uh, even sometimes it's a downloadable link to just get the firmware. So from that as a starting point, we would analyze that firmware to look for vulnerabilities or software vulnerabilities and assess the security of that product uh, to, uh, to see how it's designed. Um, and then if we wanted, you know, if we, if we needed to, we would develop an exploit um, and then, you know, provide mitigations and, and, and security controls around that. But basically our approach is to get the firmware, analyze it for software vulnerabilities, and then ideally, um, you know, if, 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 if it's needed, we'll write an exploit and provide mitigation and remediation advice as well. Nice. What type of tools do you use on the analysis sort of the vulnerability? Is it off the shelf type stuff as well, or have you got some unique ones that you've uh, we have created. some unique ones. So, uh, for example, uh, for the physically interfacing with the device, uh, maybe for firmware acquisition or uh, interacting with the device to sort of gain debug access, we have a uh, some hardware that we've custom built at Infosec. Uh, we have a tool called the Bus Side, which is a little hardware uh, board that um, interacts with um, and interfaces with particular embedded devices and especially IoT as well. So that's a really great tool to doing things like firmware acquisition and firmware dumping and also gaining debug and serial console access to the device. We also have a, um, a research grant looking at um, uh, vulnerability uh, research uh, uh, to try to find uh, bugs in source code. So that's something that um, else we use as well for these types of things. Uh, if, we, if we have a consulting um, engagement or something like that, we might use a variety of these tools uh, depending on you know what the engagement requires. Who do you find your clients are on the consulting side? Are they the operators themselves or is it from the, uh, from the auditing or consulting side, like the other consultants using specialists like you as well? We have a mix uh, of customers, I suppose. Really, um, it's sort of the broad spectrum of the industry sort of is our, is our customer base. So we'll have... Um, you know, small shops will have large shops. Um, we'll have private and public, uh, and 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 every customer has their own unique needs. But there's also a lot of overlap. A lot of customers, you know, want the same thing, which is to secure their environment and to yeah. have, you know, security in products and software and and and, and devices and so forth. So, uh, even though we have a broad customer base, you know, the needs of customers is actually, um, you know, there there is a lot of commonality in between that as well. Yeah. And I suppose the the key question is how. How successful are you on your vulnerability, uh, particularly say on firmware and firmware upgrades? Uh, how successful are you in finding uh, CVEs, I, I, I suppose, or exploits? I, I, think, I, I think we're pretty good. I mean, I think we're reasonably good at what we do. So um, there's, you know, for especially for IoT, I don't think I think. You know, IT is a great example of an industry in its infancy, um, and people, you know, in the IT market want to get their their product with their features out to market as quickly as possible. And they probably we still are at a stage of the industry where we don't have mature you know, security practice uh, or even best practice in place mm. in a lot of IT devices. So, uh, you know, even things like um, uh, in terms of software security, most IT devices aren't even running the full gamut of security mitigations and controls that we you know, use in our standard compilers on a desktop or a server system. So, I mean, that, that, that sort of indicates the maturity level. And the argument is, of course, from their perspective, from the vendor perspective, is that, you know, that they, they, they don't have high performance devices and they need to make some accommodations to get these, you know, these services and, and features out into the market without, you know, costing an arm and a leg to the, to the end customer. So, I mean, you know, until we sort of get to that, point where they do have good security practice, I mean, IT is still pretty vulnerable as, as a whole. And most devices, I would say, um, can be compromised in some way. 
Kylie actually at the ACSC uh, did a lot of work on IIT as well. Did you want to talk about uh, your work with IIT? Yeah, I was, I was going to pass to you to Kylie. And you mentioned IIT security is a passion of yours. Yeah. I suppose that's a similar question of how how uh, successful you are when you look at a new device or uh, an Internet of Things, anything connected, basically, uh, how easy yeah. it is to break. Yeah, so at, at, when I was at the ACSC, my team or my, the team that I led, we did the, we um, worked with Home Affairs on the IoT Code of Practice, the 13 right, principles yes, yes. for hardening IoT devices. Um, we also released a suite of products around that um, that was uh, sort of around best practice for vendors. And the way we sort of fed the technical knowledge into those um, into those uh, uh, products was to get a bunch of IoT devices and actually look at what had been done and what was weak in those devices, and then compiling it all together and creating the product. So lots of experience with pulling apart iot and and um, and testing them for for vulnerabilities in order to to sort of lift that security and that's really what we want to do is um you know we want people to be able to use these things in their networks but we want it to be secure so we don't want it to be a foothold for someone else to do to come into a network and do malicious things well that's iot and it iot um how with that knowledge how uh confident or are you in the infrastructure side of things on that, say, the critical infrastructure and, you know, maybe your views on where the government is in terms of the new legislation and, and uh, sort of the, some of the policy direction? Do you have views that you don't have to disclose them, but if you've got <laughs> comments or observations, is it a good thing, you know, uh, the, general, uh, yeah. the general landscape? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess um, so. We come from a technical background, um, and and I've seen a lot of thought leaders uh, throughout the industry often say that policy and techs need to work together. And a hundred percent, I agree with that. The the policy people need that tech feed, and the techs need the policy to support them as well. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of the the, uh, the the critical infrastructure bill that everyone's discussing, um, my personal opinion is I think it's good. I think that 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 we need that in Australia to lift our critical infrastructure. And at the, I mean, you know, um, there are people that are worried. Uh, definitely, uh, there are people uh, that are uh, concerned about. You know, I mean, like you said, nine sectors are covered by this. Um, you know, is 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 the government getting its hands on too much? Um, yeah. I think you know, as as citizens, we want these critical services to continue. And I think you know, um, allowing the government to to assist and work closely with critical infrastructure providers um, is what the what it's about it's not about controlling them or or, or um, you know beating them down it's more uh, that collaboration and you know yeah. working together yeah and and Sylvia your thoughts again from a policy direction maybe yeah, look I, look I think it's it's been well acknowledged that industry has been lagging in security in this area for some years so I mean that's a well established you that most security practitioners in this space have and there needed to be some sort of circuit breaker for that i mean how do you get industry you know to get to the standard required where we feel confident that there, there isn't going to be some sort of you know black swan event you know next week or next year so yeah. i mean this is a clear way that we can actually sort of have controls over you know what industry hasn't completely solved on its own so i mean if 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 you know, if everyone in industry was 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 you know enormously capable and, and had this solved already, then there wouldn't need to be this legislation. So I think this legislation is necessary, uh, and hopefully, like in the future, industry does you know hit those those lofty ideals of have, being a very secure environment. But I just don't think we're there yet. So we needed something to yeah. to, to you know to accommodate for that. I, I, I my my view is it's uh, taken a little bit too long. This should have been sort of it's the They've avoided it for as long as they could, mm -hmm. uh, but eventually. So the, the, that was the takeaway from yesterday: is that it is needed. Uh, and uh, the other thing is critical infrastructure and all of these IoT, uh, the manufacturers, uh, and all of this has major implications for national se uh, security and uh, and our sort of independent interdependent systems. Uh, but governments just there watching; they can't let they, all of that sit there vulnerable uh yeah. they have to they have to move on it and so it is a challenge for them and again we heard from uh mike in terms of how the us is doing this so this is a sort of global trend that we're dealing with um maybe the any any out any takeaways i suppose from the backgrounds and career development that you've had to where you've got to now 
uh, sort of just moving to that area of any <laughs> advice that you have to people to make that leap, as you say, stepping off the cliff edge, um, <laughs> any advice that you've got? I mean, you've, you've built careers first uh, in certain disciplines uh, and then moved off, but uh, how are you finding the business? Uh, running a business is, is completely different from having a job, yeah? Yeah, it's super different. It's um, And it's probably uh, nothing I could have pre prepared myself for. It's very different to what I thought it was going to be. Um, I sort of had in my mind freedoms, <laughs> and <all sorts> <laughs> <things>. <laughs> lazing around all day in the backyard. <laughs> no, no, but um, it, I would say that like everything um, in life that's worthwhile is going to be slightly risky. And I think um, I would encourage other people to, to put themselves out of their comfort zone. Um, and try new things. It's sort of by trying new things that we grow as people and grow and grow as professionals. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's different, um, but I'm loving it. It's really good fun, um, yeah. and it's uh, it's very different to the last twelve years. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and maybe also for women in security as well. I mentioned we've got the Women's Security ASEAN Awards next week as well. Um, but yeah, any any advice there or uh, again, observations getting better. Okay, I mean, um, yeah. yeah, I think I think definitely things are improving. I guess. Um, so I was at uni in the nineties. Not that security was uh, a big thing. I was more I was engineering and IT. Um, but um, definitely everything is improving. But I still think we have a long way to go. Uh, I think things like the awards are fantastic for highlighting the great work women are doing out in the industry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a road that we're on, and hopefully, it will improve over more time. <laughs> well, it's a, yeah, it's a long yeah, it's a long term uh, sort of approach that we have to keep support. Um, and yeah. Sylvia, maybe from the business side, uh, being in Canberra, and you, technically, you know, you guys are still a startup. Um, how have you found the support for a new business and cybersecurity business there? Uh, sounds like you're growing, but you, and you're doing good work. But anything there from a, the business perspective that you found? Well, I, I think a good example of like our, our thoughts before and afterwards come from the conference that we run, B Sides Canberra. And yeah. when we sort of initiated B Sides Canberra, we thought to ourselves, "Is anyone actually going to attend a conference in Canberra? Does, is the Canberra <laughs> computer security large enough that we are going to have delegates come to their conference?" And now we you know, are the biggest sort of hacker conference in Australia. We had 2,600 people attend this year and uh, a significant portion of those are from Canberra. So, I mean, it, maybe it's not, not the best kept secret anymore. Maybe a lot of people know this, but the Canberra computer, computer security is it's quite large. I mean, every yeah. organization in Canberra is going to have some sort of security team. A lot of organizations are headquartered in, in Canberra as well. So. The Canberra community, uh, computer community, is 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 really good and and, and really good. Um, and so we have a lot of events as well outside of B sides Canberra. We have the C sides monthly meetups. There's a number of other meetups in Canberra, like um, Sec Talks and even OWASP occasionally runs stuff as well, and Acer do stuff as well here, also. So there's a lot of events that you can in, in, you know interact with other people in the community, and it's growing sort of bigger every year. Um, and it, now when I go to a conference in other cities. They'll be like, oh, this is the Canberra community that's come to yeah. you know, these conferences, and you'll see them at conferences. Whereas, you know, maybe a decade ago, uh, it was a lot more closed and a lot more, um, you know, warded off from the rest of Australia. Um, and I think, you know, that insight into the Canberra community is large is is applied to infosect as well. I mean, we have a great base of um, customers here in Canberra, uh, but Australia in general as well has a growing, you know, security industry. Uh, you look at organisations like um, Oz Cyber reporting on, you know, where Australia is and where it's been and where it's going. And cyber security is, you know, for my entire career, it's just been on an upward trajectory. Yep. And that there's no sign of that slowing down. Um, You're going to run out COVID, of work. <laughs> yeah, even yeah. in COVID, it was, yeah. it was even just getting bigger and bigger. So, I mean, which is sort of, you know, you know, it's, it's, yep. a, it's a threat that, that hasn't been, you know, eliminated at all. And it seems to be just getting uh, more and more important. Well, maybe uh, we're obviously all in lockdown on the uh, sort of Sydney ACT at the moment, Melbourne as well. Um, the B-Sides, what's the call out for B-Sides uh, 2022? 
looking okay or oh, not no. sure? So we've um, decided to um, not run in 2022 just because of COVID risks Got it. and the size of the conference. Um, yeah. If it was smaller, if it was more just Canberra based, we would we would keep it going. But with with the number of people travelling to come, it just it, it, yeah. it didn't bode well. So we will be back for 2023 though. <laughs> yeah, and I think B sides Perth is going to keep going. <laughs> so that might be the only B side still yeah. going. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's potentially about... this month onto September, right? It is, it is. I think they've, they've swapped to hybrid, so we'll be there virtually because we right. can't fly over there. But, yeah, we had our tickets to B-Sides Perth bought the minute it opened, and we usually okay. come. We usually come over to Perth every year for B-Sides Perth. But, um, yeah. yeah, hybrid, so we'll be online watching what's happening for in, in Perth. Well, look, um, and and uh, shout out to the Perth crew over there, and uh, hopefully they'll, they'll check it out. But uh, And I'll put their dates on. I'll, I'll do a bit of background and see when the, that B-Sides Perth is on. Um, now, I suppose the last one to finish off is your longer-term plans. Uh, you've gone through the startup and we've talked a little bit, maybe not so much on the challenges. You've, what, what, what have been some of the key challenges you've been up against? Uh, you're running a family. I saw a, a tail in the background there. You've got pets there as well. Uh, so other than just running a family, um, what are some of the key key challenges that you've faced and maybe also some of the longer term plans you've got? We were talking about this this morning, actually, our challenges, because I it, we don't have a lot, I guess. I think we're, Good. Because we're, we're doing what we love. We're, we're pretty pretty happy. But um, I guess maybe the challenge is that the, the amount of work and that sort of that scaling um, quickly is a, yeah. is a bit, bit trickier um, than we would anticipate. Um, and, and maybe that, like, um, for, for me, what I've noticed, uh, so, um, you know, at, in the government, I got to be very specialised in what I did. I was very hands-on. I was a tech director, so I was pretty happy happy with that role. As I've moved into business, I've become broader and that, that, that upskilling ups in terms of talking to customers or, yeah. you know, engaging and be, probably being more public is a bit harder for me as well, which I think I told you about before coming on the interview, that, like, not 100%... Um, open on what I've done for the last You've 12 years. You've still got years. the government, government in the background going, don't <laughs> say anything, don't say that's anything. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, yeah, but those are all challenges that have been fun to, to, to tackle and overcome and and, and move, move on with. Um, Silvio, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> no, just to reiterate that the broadness. I mean, as a as a you know as a specialist in a you know a certain role in you know in in you you know in a you know working for someone else, you have a very specific role, and that's what you're doing. And you know maybe you extend and you talk to different groups and you, you interact. But as a business owner, I mean, you are solely responsible for absolutely everything that happens underneath you. So, I mean, if there's you know, from you know, if there's infrastructure that needs fixing, if there's a toilet that needs clean, ultimately you are the person responsible for it. So, yeah. I mean, you, you know, and whether that's delegating to someone else or finding an appropriate solution, or, or or doing the work yourself, I mean, ultimately the buck comes down to you. And I think that's um, you know, that in in all leadership roles, I think taking on that responsibility and ownership of of what happens is is an important part. And as a business old, a business owner, you can't escape that. It's also the rewarding part, though, isn't it? It's uh, I call it a working lifestyle, uh, where mm -hmm. it is just part of your life. It's not a job that you can switch off on. And holidays, uh, there is no holiday. <laughs> you say? Um, and and the longer term plans, how how do you how are you going to manage the growth as well? Are you going to just take it on, or do you have a are you working to a strategy or, yeah. Because you're following a passion at the moment, that's yeah. that's okay. But then you know you might be creating a monster here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And passion can only take you so far. I guess you need that sort of that uh, that that strategy and those plans and the vision for where the business will go from here. Um, and I guess as we're sort of growing, we're we're working towards that, and we're yeah, we're sort of building that up. Um, yeah. Um, so Sylvia, did you? Want we to haven't reached, we haven't reached our natural plateau yet in terms of of company yep. size. So we we do, uh, it, we do plan for some growth, and we've certainly had strategic conversations about about where we see ourselves, you know, in in a few years' time. But we we do see ourselves as growing bigger. Um, but um, you know, we don't want to grow bigger for the arbitrary purpose of growing bigger. We don't want to yep. follow the trajectory of a startup from you know going from. You know, accelerating as quickly as possible to get as many customers as possible, and and you know start getting revenue as as you know and increasing as as you know in certain you know styles and percentages. We just want to grow you know somewhat organically, but we also want to 
you know, we want to deliver great work for our customers. And if our customers keep on coming back to us with more work, I mean, we feel yeah. we feel that's a good thing. And we think that that's reasonable justification for growing as opposed to growing to, you know, an, an aspirational goal of, you know, becoming the biggest company of X, Y, Z or something like that. So we do see growth, but we want it to be you know, well managed and well tailored and not growth for no specific purpose. Yep. I think that's a great, well, that's one, I think that backs to the passion that you've got, but also it's a good strategy because you just don't need that stress. You want to enjoy the journey, so to speak. <laughs> uh, and again, I think uh, if you're moving up to eight, potentially, you know, moving into double figures, uh, uh, people bring headaches along the way. So <laughs> maybe you need to, to uh, stem the flows to, um, potentially. Thanks, Gary. It's good to have you on, mate. Um, I won't, I won't repeat his comment, uh, but uh, look, thank you so much for that. Um, maybe just some final takeaways on the industry overall. Any uh, sort of feedback to the industry, how it's uh, handled uh, the COVID as well? Um, yeah, there's been, been quite a lot uh, going on. Just general news all tends to be quite negative and bad. But the cybersecurity sector has sort of picked up. You know, we've had a massive uptake in attacks, uh, ransomware and the like. As we said, uh, new legislation coming through. How do you think the industry is faring? You two are leaders in the in the industry. I certainly view that, um, and obviously they're in the capital as well. Ha general observations, just to close off on how the sector is going and and how 2022 looks like as well. Look, I think there's a bit of doom and gloom in the media and. You know, in one perspective, it looks like security is 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 becoming sort of unmanageable, and it's a you know it's a growing problem, and more and more people are affected by the negative consequences of lack of security. Uh, but I am actually pretty much an optimist, and I do believe that we have good people in the industry that are actively working to make things better. And so I have a very positive view that in the long run, you know, things are looking good. Um, you know, regardless of the ups and downs that are, that are occurring on a day to day basis, I think, you know, in the long term, things are, you know, are, are positive. And, you know, certainly from some aspects uh, of the world, you know, there's there's tangible measurements of improvement. I mean, the, the, in terms of, for example, desktop security from your Windows operating systems, um, you know, the security has improved massively over the past, you know, 15 or 20 years. And even though we seem to be getting more and more attacks, it's becoming harder for some of these attackers to actually, yeah. you know, attack things. So in some senses, there is objective improvement, but the scale of it is just growing massively. So it seems a little bit like doom and gloom, but ultimately a positive outcome, I think, in the, you know, in that future that we, that we, that we all share. And Kylie, maybe from you is, uh, and the career, opportunities that this has uh, as well, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, what I've noticed most about the industry is how big it's growing. It's just, it, it's it's a boom industry. Um, everyone's sort of moving into it. I think I mentioned to Sylvia this morning, I, I think I went to three ACSC openings in my career. <laughs> Each yeah, one, right. getting, the ACSC is getting bigger and bigger. So we sort of started at the basement of ASD went into the BCB and now in Brindabella Park with Home Affairs. So um, definitely just this growth. And I guess um, when an industry grows this quickly, there's always going to be that sort of growing pains where you have yeah. new people coming in. And I guess that's where uh, companies like InfoSec can fill in uh, that knowledge gap of the of people joining into cybersecurity um, and help uplift um, the people that are joining the industry quickly to, to fill in the need that's there. Yeah, I think that's a really good point of uh, it is a good indicator when uh, you see businesses like yourselves uh, yeah. sort of uh, sprouting out, so to speak, uh, yeah. and also doing some quality work as well. So, um, look, thank you so much, uh, Kylie and Silvio. That was the really the intention of me uh, reaching out to you and bringing you on and having a chat. And you can see from some of the feedback that we've got uh, on the LinkedIn crew, uh, they do appreciate <laughs> that. And it's good to get that positive message across, uh, even though it's quite gloomy today. <laughs> uh, uh, across the world. So look, on that note, uh, Kylie McDevitt and Silvio Cesare, InfoSec researchers with Canberra's Hackerspace, an analysis of InfoSec researching with a passion. I'll let you go, I'll put you backstage and awesome. thank you so much. Enjoy the rest thank of your day. You. Thank Thanks you very much, it's been great. All right, see you guys. <laughs>